Hello, everyone. I am um, having great pleasure to do the introduction to the FNIRS and EG integration webinar. I will start off with my personal take and why I'm so excited about that. And this should give uh, some three minutes for the latecomers to arrive and figure out the technology. I personally have done some eight years of EEG research and then I worked 10 years for an EEG company. However, I did my PhD on combining EEG and fMRI and I was back then already very excited that uh, we have this additional two modalities and what you could do with it. And I started off as many people did and said, oh, EEG gives you that great timing and fMRI gives you the spatial location. So I will end up with spatial and timing information and understand the physiological process is so much better. And then I quickly realized, yes, it works. You get some additional time and spatial information. However, it's not the same signal. And yeah, there's EEG blind FNIS activity and vice versa. So what do you actually gain? And then that was what my PhD was about. Which ways could you combine the data and what do you learn depending on how you integrate those data? And to me, it turned out we are in the business, researchers in the business of explaining variants, right? Small p-value means you were successful in explaining variants in an experiment in understanding something better. So it was a great modality or the combination allowed insights, not only in getting clearer results in one modality like the EG, because I explained some variants out, but also it allowed me to learn something completely new, like what is this variation of this EEG component is linked to the variation of some FNIS components. So the integration gave me information that was is not accessible if I only have the one modality. So I obviously switched from fMRI to FNIRS, and there's some advantages to the FNIRS compared to the fMRI. Um, and the one that I find the most important one is that you get, the, or how do I rank them? But you have a better signal to noise because you have this faster sampling rate. You can regress out the artifacts and hence you can end up like in a real time application having a better signal to noise ratio. The other thing is that you're not only measuring the deoxy, but you get oxy and deoxy. And while the signals are fairly high correlated, they're not fully correlated. They at independent information. And then there's practicality. So it's obviously cheaper and you can use it in real life settings and so on and so forth. All that being said, now you end up having those two modalities and you would like to have them integrated. You would preferably have them just in one box that does exactly what you have in one easy data stream. So why do we have this webinar and showing you how to integrate that? We've been to that consideration to, you know, building one device, but then it turned out quickly that research is very diverse, very in, in, in the questions that you ask and the demands that you have in the perfect setting, the perfect FNIS device is not the same device for every researcher and the perfect EEG device, it depends really on your, on your study, on your population, on your research goals. So we ended up very quickly with the realization that locking you down to one combined device wasn't a good idea. So we worked with the best partners out there to make sure we integrate as good as possible. We talk frequently and make an integrated data stream and integrated, you know, that the devices can live together on physically on the head and live together as a software. We make our best efforts to integrate them to allow you to choose whatever devices configuration you need to combine to have the best for your research. However, that leaves us with a little challenge to how do you do it? How do you integrate those two devices now? And that is what we hopefully going to answer today um, where we have this webinar. So some considerations to the webinar. Now I hope I'm getting my next slide. Oh, that was two. Um, we love, love, love to hear from you always, but during the webinar, you are muted. Questions are always welcome. Please go to your webinar panel on the side. If you click there, you can, that window, you can chat, you can post the questions. The context, don't take notes, will be available. We put that on our webinars page. Uh, link is there where you will find 
um, this webinar. And if you have additional questions, don't be shy, write to consulting at Nirexus. We love uh, several consultants, which, as I said, we love to hear from you and we are happy to answer your questions. Okay, um, we are Nirex. We are companies since 20 years focused on brain imaging with NIRS. You can, we can use the devices also to do simpler stuff like muscle also, but where real expertise is, is brain imaging. We are, most of our team is based out of Berlin, um, where we invent, design, manufacture those devices and hardware and software. So yes, we are actually building it in Berlin. And uh, we also have there our uh, logistics and so on and so forth. But we also, our mother company is in the US where we also have support and sales offices. Okay, today the webinar um, will be <laughs> made possible, will be um, Lamia, Fasalik will guide you, is our support manager, and will guide you through the webinar as our moderator. In the background, we have Dr. Mai Valjori, who uh, one of our scientific consultants, and together with Dr. Megan Henry, our marketing manager, she uh, they will collect the question and sort the question so we get uh, the chance to answer as much as we can. Um, our speakers today, I'm very happy and proud to introduce the lineup. Dr. Alexander von Lerman just recently uh, joined NYREX, um, worked before in Boston, Harvard, MG, Anderson, the Boston, the Martino Center, I think Martino Center is what everyone knows. And he actually works in a long time in EEG and FNIRS. He invented one of the first devices, and I'm pretty sure he has the first patent on an integrated EEG FNIRS device, and since then has pushed both sides. So his background is engineering, but to really allow him to push the limits of this engineering, he also did the research, and I, there has a wonderful paper out on combined uh, on combined on multimodal measurements. Ma Maria Adelia Schwadmari, she works, has four years of consulting experience, works also for NYREX, um, and she has worked before in EEG and BCI, so with one modality, and now finished her PhD on FNIS, I think, with, M uh, with MS patients, and so is an active researcher. And, Hence, very uh, well aware when she consults people to know how it looks on the other side. Yeah. And then we have David Medina, which I'm um, particularly happy here to introduce uh, Dr. David Medina, I should say that. But we worked together for quite a while. Um, he did his PhD with music in San Diego. Uh, he works for the, then at the Schwartz Center and the Swartz Center is an amazing place to be. There's a lot of the most amazing tools that we currently have in psychophysiology research, like EEG Lab and uh, and LSL, come from there. And David was one of the masterminds and builders of, of LSL, so knows the software really inside out. Then he switched and worked for Brain Products, um, which I think think is the leading manufacturer of research EEG devices, and that is where I also had the pleasure of working with him, and he implemented there some of these tools and this knowledge and brought it and made it hence even more available to the research community. And now he switches, he moved to Australia, where he has now his own company, Diademics, where he consults now more than just one company and brings the LSL to an even wider community and enables even more companies to work in this format. And in the end, just it makes the researchers' life easier. So you can get more devices that are all up to the standard and they are integrated nicely into LSL. And now I would hand over to Alex, who is giving us some more consideration into the e why EEG, or I think into the hardware of EEG and FNS. Thanks so much. Thank you. Um, so I hope everybody sees my screen. I'm um, very happy to yeah give a little more of a motivation um, for uh, FNS EEG integration, also some of the hardware considerations that should be taken into, into account. 
so why do a multimodal approach in the first place? Uh, Patrick already uh, spoke about this, but I want to briefly go back to this. Um, we uh, have several frontiers in neuroscience right now, uh, actually many, and the field is um, progressing very rapidly. Um, two especially are, at least for me, very interesting, and that is um, the uh, approach is now to look into microscopic brain activity in naturalistic environments. So bring the person uh, from the lab uh, into the real world. But uh, of course, that's only one of the, of the fields that are moving forward. Um, still and always the fundamental research in neuroscience and medicine um, is going to look into how does the healthy brain function, how does the diseased brain function, and how do micro microcirculation and neuronal uh, activity, how they interact. And so um, there's a lot of challenges that have to be addressed to you know, do these kinds of research um, um, nicely. And uh, among them are that we have to decrease the constraints in the acquisition. Uh, we have to get more robust measurements and we have to um, increase the information and the signal quality as, uh, that we acquire in an experiment as good as possible. And, Quite obviously, um, the instrumentation, the integration, the multimodal instrumentation is a prerequisite of uh, performing novel experiments um, that yield data sets for this kind of science and this kind of research. And those data sets can also be used for um, the development of novel multimodal signal processing approaches. And those will hopefully ultimately help us to exploit brain and body signals even better by integrating all the information um, and increase the robustness of the uh, evaluation methods uh, and of their research results. Just a brief note, hope this is not in the way. Oops, oh, sorry, this was the click. Um, let me get back to this. Um, a brief note uh, that the uh, next week's webinar on the 18th of August is going to deal with this multimodal signal processing of EG and F nurse. Dr. Ted Hubbard is going to talk about this. Well, very briefly, um, uh, what is EEG and um, how is it different from FNIRS? Um, we measure neuroelectrical activity with EEG. Um, the signal uh, stems from a large number of synchronously firing neurons, mostly uh, pyramid cells, and uh, is a comparatively weak electromagnetic signal. So we need high performance instrumentation to pick the signal up robustly and, and in a good quality. Um, due to volume conduction in the head, the spatial resolution of EG is somewhat limited. Um, however, the temporal resolution, as uh, Patrick also pointed briefly out, is, is much better. And um, uh, we're talking about the order of milliseconds here. Um, in contrast to this, um, if we look at functional near infrared spectroscopy, um, we, we are looking at markers for neurometabolic activity um, using um, optics, using near infrared light in the optical window between 600 and 950 nanometers. And again, the signal that we measure is a very weak optical signal, so uh, we need high-performance instrumentation to, uh, to actually robustly measure this, uh, this uh, response that we're interested in. Um, the spatial resolution of FNIRS is um, somewhat better than EEG, um, and due to the comparatively slow physiological response, um, due to slow uh, neurovascular coupling, the temporal resolution in terms of the physiology is comparatively low. So Patrick mentioned this already. Um, but uh, this makes clear why uh, an integration of especially FNIRS and EEG can make sense. And I want to briefly uh, summarize uh, this on basically all the um, available ends. Um, the signals, the uh, metabolic and the uh, neuroelectric signals are complementary in their information, um, but also the artifacts, the neurophysiological, but also physiological artifacts in the signals um, are different. We have EOG, we have EMG, and other electrophysiological artifacts. In the EEG, we have the pulse wave and slow um, uh, hemodynamic oscillations in, in the FNIRS. And uh, it can be interesting to look into those additional signals and the plethora of, of um, signals and information that we gather when we measure FNIRS and EEG together to uh, better understand the state of the body that this brain is actually working in. So they complement uh, each other in terms of the signal. That is the most important point here. But also EEG and FNIRS are very similar in the complexity and in the setup time, um, which um, makes the match very well. And uh, are both miniaturizable and wearable, which is especially interesting when uh, both uh, FNIRS and EEG are supposed to be taken, uh, for example, on the backpack out of the lab. Um, as opposed to X-ray and, and other modalities, we don't have any problems with uh, hazards. They are non-invasive, non-hazardous, so you can do long-term monitoring, also something that fMRI uh, cannot easily do. 
And uh, compared, for example, to fMRI or PET, um, both modalities are comparatively low cost. So these are um, some of the good reasons why, why we want to do a combined FNRS EG. And um, I want to now just briefly um, point out some of the challenges or what to look out for. So NEREX supports all research-grade EG solutions. That's very important, um, especially through LSL. Um, you can basically use any EG solution that, that um, uh, supports LSL. However, we uh, recommend high-end devices. Coming back to the uh, signal quality aspect um, that I discussed briefly in the, in the beginning on EG and FNIRS, um, NEREX tries to um, build and supply the best quality FNIRS devices out there. And on the EG side, we recommend to, to use the same. We, uh, we recommend to use amplifiers that are very low noise and very high resolution uh, that enable trigger integration that in the best case scenarios have active electrodes um, supported a one cap setup approach and allow the electrodes to be freely placed. Why that? Um, there are some challenges. Um, there are always challenges, but um, combining EG and FNERS or doing multimodal research in general um, incorporates challenges such as that um, all the probes, electrodes, and optodes have to be placed and, and localized and co-localized. And for this, it is very helpful um, to have a system that enables this in the first place, but also to increase the speed of the setup itself. Um, it is good to have active electrodes and very sensitive uh, nearest probes. Um, as this um, will decrease the waiting time for a subject and um, because you would, of course, nobody wants their subject to be tired before the experiment even starts. And of course, setup time increases the more, multi the more modalities are being used um, instantaneously. Lastly, um, the uh, setup itself also of the instrumentation um, uh, should be uh, with as little constraints as possible and without loss of any signal quality and most importantly especially for the signal analysis um, of the uh, of the experimental data and and subsequently of the research outputs it is very important that the signals are synchronized very well and now especially those two last points um, the flexible setup um, of the instrumentation and the synchronization of signals um, this is where now LSL comes into place uh, the lab stream layer and I'm very very happy to uh, pass on to Dr. David Medina to tell us more about LSL Okay. Uh, I don't think my screen is showing quite yet because I missed the. Uh, my screen should be showing. I'm going to say that my screen is showing. Okay, good. Uh, so uh, let me prepare my slides now and. Uh, I am going to introduce the lab streaming layer uh, in the context of multimodal data acquisition. Um, and I will try to focus on FNIRS and EEG. In fact, I don't have much experience with FNIRS. Uh, as Patrick mentioned, I worked for some time in an EEG laboratory developing tools such as LSL, um, which makes it really exciting for me to be involved in this because it's always fun to uh, learn new uh, things that you can do and uh, FNIRS is a very exciting technology and NIREX, of course, makes the best uh, FNIRS uh, systems that are available for research. Um, and Patrick also mentioned or uh, showed that I, I've actually uh, been working with, with NIREX since I began at Brain Products a few years ago because uh, we did a joint grant together uh, to work on a, a BCI application that used FNIRS and EEG uh, and we indeed, indeed used LSL to combine the signals for that for that project. So what's the deal with LSL? So my job today is to show a little bit about how to use LSL and hopefully this will um, convince everybody why it is such an important tool, that it is an important tool. Um, and I will try to make the following points uh, slash arguments uh, again and again. Um, what LSL is very good at is fusing data from different devices. So it's a way to take data from um, different modalities and provide a way to record them in a unified fashion, to stream them in a unified fashion, and most importantly, of course, to synchronize them. And LSL can provide a lot of automatic tools that make this process um, more or less fail safe. Uh, it's a complicated technology and there are ways to abuse it, uh, but if used correctly, it can be your friend. 
and take care of a lot of problems without um, the a lot of a lot of uh, um, a lot of a lot of uh, coding or ad hoc solutions from the researcher. Uh, I also want to stress again and again that LSL is a very flexible tool. So Patrick mentioned, why don't we provide a one-stop shop for combined EEG and FNIRS? Well, there are many different questions to answer with this technology, and there are many different configurations that we need to put these devices into. And it would limit our uh, research goals if we were to uh, limit the ways in which we can combine them. And LSL is a way that we can rely, or it's a device that we can rely on to do things in a flexible and reliable way. Uh, and the other thing I want to say is that LSL is good and it's also getting better. It's an actively developed technology. Uh, it's a funded technology. Uh, it's an open source project, but we are getting funded um, from various grant sources. We've always been grant funded. And a lot of exciting things are happening and a lot of things have happened in the last few years and continue um, to develop in a, in a good direction. Uh, so uh, to begin with, I, I thought I would begin sort of backwards. Normally we talk about theory first and then go to practice, but I thought it would be better for people who are not familiar with what LSL can do if I showed that and then talk about how it works and why the technology was developed, which hopefully can um, give you an idea of what can be done. Um, so by way of doing this, I thought of the worst EEG psychology experiment in the world, uh, which is, uh, let's say we want to study event-related potentials in EEG where our uh, time zero uh, for our epochs um, uh, has to do with mouse button clicks. We want to see how the brain reacts when somebody clicks on a mouse. Uh, excuse me, my audio uh, seemed to have disappeared for a moment, but now it seems to be back. We need we need the triggers to be reliable because oftentimes when we do EEG analysis, we we want to uh, average across trials. Um, and if we average across a shifting point in time, of course, we will average out a lot of data, which is bad. Uh, so we need to have our triggers to be reliably timed. So how do I get the click triggers in my EEG? Uh, this would require either custom hardware, we could put a little sensor on a mouse or buy a very expensive mouse-like device that we could uh, connect to our computer and also to um, an EEG amplifier's trigger port. Uh, we could also try to hack our operating system uh, and try to harvest the mouse clicks there, or we could simply use LSL. Um, and LSL kind of deals with all of these problems for us. So this would be a glimpse at an LSL workstation for this uh, silly uh, toy experiment. Um, and this is a screenshot from my computer. And let me break down what these uh, components are. So this is a application that simply takes mouse button clicks and converts them into LSL messages. Uh, this is a application that connects to the Brain Products LiveAmp device. It's called the LiveAmp uh, connector and it will stream our EEG data. Uh, we have a, a monitoring um, program which can uh, monitor arbitrary LSL streams. It doesn't have to be EEG, it can be anything. Uh, and this is actually a new software that Brain Products uh, put out as a freeware tool. Uh, it's called the Brain Vision LSL Viewer. And it shows, uh, as you can see, it it can show you signal traces here from your EAG device. And it also has a nice feature. It will plot an FFT uh, in real time as well. And finally, we have the lab recorder, which is uh, what we use to record data from our various devices here. Um, so now I thought I would uh, sort of go through getting set up 
uh, again, this is kind of a toy experiment. I, I don't have uh, all the tools necessary to do a real uh, EEG experiment, but I believe uh, Nyrex will do this um, for us, a combined FMRC EEG experiment. Uh, the, if you Google lab streaming layer or LSL, you'll most likely find this link first. Um, and this is a little daunting sometimes for researchers to see. People who are not software developers are a little bit scared or turned off or confused when they jump into a code repository. Um, but this is really the main page for LSL. Uh, and this has all the source code in it, but it also has links to a lot of other things such as online documentation. There's a lot of information here about getting help. You can uh, links to documentation. Uh, there's also a mailing list and an invite to a Slack channel, which can help you get started. So the information is a little bit uh, spread out, but it is there. Um, and the good thing is that even though uh, this is a source code repository and LSL is a, is, a, is a actively developed open source product, many of the things that you need to do an experiment, you can just get. Um, there are applications that are already pre-built and available. And I've thrown a lot of links into this uh, presentation and um, hopefully these are not hard to find either. So for example, the lab recorder program, which you need to record LSL streams, you can simply download a distribution either for Macintosh, Linux, Windows, um, and it will just work for you. Uh, and this is true for many of the other devices that are commonly used, and many of them are actively developed, and we try to take advantage of the latest technology and to, um, to, to make available tools that are connected to the, to, to the best possible uh, devices. Um, there's also a lot of legacy apps uh, that are available from this FTP server, um, which you can get if need be. Um, those are not so much actively developed, but uh, some of them, like the, the application for mouse button presses, build just works. And if you need it, you can use it. It's a little bit of a silly old fashioned app, but it does the job. And um, there's a lot of little uh, treats like that here at that FTP. And here's just a link to um, the documentation that uh, shows the list of supported devices and also gives you uh, links to where you can get these devices. Um, and you'll notice that uh, all the brain products uh, devices are on here. Uh, Muse interacts on Muse, uh, Cognionix, and of course, Nyrex devices are also um, supporting LSL natively, and you can find links to that information here. Uh, so if we are going to set up an experiment, um, there are a few certain things I like to do, and I thought I would walk through it really quickly just to give you an idea of uh, what this process is like, and then I'll get into more of the um, theoretical stuff. So what I like to do is make shortcuts to all my uh, uh, devices because LSL is a flexible tool, and flexibility means uh, lots of little pieces oftentimes. Um, so I put all my LSL apps after I download them into an LSL apps folder, and then I make shortcuts. So when I want to do a new experiment, I can make a folder and call it experiment or whatever is appropriate. And then oftentimes I will want to put a folder for my data in there. And then I can simply populate this folder with whichever tools I need for the experiment. So for example, if I want to, most of the time, of course, I'm going to need um, my viewing application for monitoring, I can put that in there. Um, if I want to use the Brain Vision Recorder for connecting to a Brain Products device, I can put that in there. Um, and then I will need to connect to the recorder and turn it into an LSL stream, and this is the app for that. And of course, I'll want to record my data, um, but I don't believe that's the latest version. So I'll just grab the latest version and put it in there. And then when I'm preparing my experiment, I can very easily just go to my experiment folder and I have all the tools that I need. 
And all these tools are also configurable. You can add configuration files. So if you need to set them up in a specific way for a specific experiment, you can do that ahead of time. So when it comes time to collect your data and deal with human subjects who you would probably pay money in order to um, uh, take pictures of their brain while they do things, uh, you don't need to make them wait around. And uh, your lab technician can feel confident that he or she is actually uh, can go through a very simple process and you can make notes and show them and put this here as well. Um, so just by way of, uh, just to show you LSL in action a little bit, I thought I'd start some of these applications. Um, the Brain Products uh, Recorder is used for recording, uh, setting up amplifiers, looking at impedances and also recording data. You can also monitor data. I've configured mine just to simulate uh, I'm just doing two channels of, of quote-unquote EEG, uh, which is really just some sinusoids here. Uh, and if I want to uh, connect this to LSL, there's a handy feature in the Brain Vision Recorder called Remote Data Access. And if I enable Remote Data Access, then I can um, uh, transfer this data into an LSL stream using my remote data access client, which is a very simple app. All you do is give it the host name of the PC you want to connect to. It's 127.0.0.1 because that is universally the name of the local computer, which is what I'm connected to. And then I simply hit link, and now I'm connected. Uh, I'm not shown here. I have another computer that's sending simulated data from some Python scripts that I wrote. Uh, one is sending random noise at 250 hertz, uh, one channel of random noise, and the other is sending random markers, which I can pretend are either uh, uh, stimulus uh, markers, screen flips, uh, red square appears on the screen, whatever. And now if I want to monitor these, I can simply start my viewing application, and which looks very much like the recorder. And if I click connect, it takes a minute to find the other streams, but they should come soon. Sometimes they appear faster than others. It, well, in any case, we can look at this stream, make the scale larger. So this is actually uh, showing an LSL stream rather than uh, uh, the, although it's the same, it's simply this, these, these waveforms forwarded as an LSL stream. Now let me see if I can find my other stream, which should be on my home network here. And of course, when I do this to practice, it works great, but when I do it live, I have trouble. Um, sometimes, no. I have done the wrong thing. Let me try this one more time. Let's make a shortcut, create a shortcut. Go up here. Uh, excuse me. Well, I fail at being a guru of LSL. And let's take a look. Yeah, so the lab recorder is finding my streams no problem. Cancel my brain vision viewer. Ah, so now I see my streams. Um, so just to give you an uh, overview of what I'm doing here, this Linux dash sim stream is the random noise that I'm sending, and my marker stream is random markers. Uh, so here's random noise, and you can see there's random markers, test, test, marker, test. There's a few different options, XXX. There's one called blah, uh, which should pop up. Um, and the idea, there's blah. And the idea is I want to synchronize my random noise with my sinusoids. Uh, so I can also monitor, uh, oh, come show. I can monitor these and record these at the same time. Um, 
I already made a recording, so I'm not going to walk through the process of it uh, just now. But just to give you a uh, indication of what we're trying to do here, come back to my slides, which have, of course, disappeared on me. Uh, now that we've set up our experiment, protected ourselves with safeguards by configuring our applications, uh, we can record and we can we can epoch our data. So we can imagine now that this uh, this is our EEG trace, and the blue line is some other signal that we're interested in co-registering in our analysis process, and we've epoched our data uh, around time zero corresponding to the markers that said blah. Now, whenever blah appears, we can co-register our sinusoids and our random noise. Uh, in real life, this would, of course, be something like EEG and FMIRS. Uh, so why do I need LSL? Um, just to come back to this point, this seemed like a lot of work, right? This was very complicated. There are many different types of software components. Uh, we're recording to a sort of maybe not everybody's heard of the XDF data format, which is what we use to record an LSL. And of course, there's a lot of things you saw I was having a little bit of trouble with the networking. There's a lot of opportunity for operator error. Uh, and there's probably some other arguments you could find for not using LSL. But I would argue that LSL actually provides a number of things that you want. Uh, for one thing, there's immense flexibility. Uh, for another thing, there are many safety features such as automatic reconnection, um, configuration files, and data caching. Um, that LSL provides behind the scenes to make your experiments uh, more or less foolproof. Uh, the other thing that's important about LSL is it's extensible. We can make new paradigms using this technology, and this gives us a lot of room to experiment with new ideas. And if we lock ourselves into a very rigid configuration, we'll never be able to do these sorts of things. Um, and I would also say that when used properly, LSL will automatically synchronize, synchronize data streams and markers, and you won't have to rely on a lot of complicated, what I like to call hardware spaghetti, when you have many, many cables running from many, many different uh, devices. And uh, the reason we came up with this uh, idea back in 2012 um, was... Uh, well, let me let me uh, reiterate here. Uh, so LSL is a constellation of many different things. There's libraries and there are apps uh, that enable us to um, stream, collect, record, and synchronize biophysical data and associated signals. It's associated with the data format, which was designed for and with LSL and enables multimodal data recording. Uh, it was developed at the Schwartz Center for Computational Neuroscience. Um, with the intention of powering tools for research in mobile brain body imaging, which is uh, known as MOBI, and this began in 2012, as I said before. And LSL is an open source software project, um, which I like because I like open source software. Uh, and it's licensed under the MIT license, which is a very permissive license. It basically means that anybody can use LSL for any reason um, as long as they uh, include the original copyright. This means that you can sell uh, software that has LSL in it and you don't have to pay any fees or anything like this. And this is good because we want hardware vendors and also manufacturers of consumer devices, for example, the Garmin sports watch would be a nice thing to have um, to use LSL in their devices. And we don't wanna make it difficult for people to do that. Um, as I've said before, and I will say again, LSL is an actively developed and ever-expanding project. Uh, so just a little bit about the structure of LSL. The real heart of, the, of LSL is a, uh, is a network protocol. It's a way for computers to communicate with each other. They send and receive data according to patterns that they expect to see. Um, and because these things obey certain rules, the user doesn't have to deal with the problems of network connectivity, which is a very nice thing. You don't have to tell an LSL receiver what the IP address is, what port it is, 
um, they know how to find each other. And this is good. And controlling that is the, the library, um, which is written in C++, which is, um, which is what this controls the protocol. It's what actually, um, um, what do you call the word? I'm forgetting the word. It basically implements the protocol. And on top of that is a number of program wrappers so that application developers can choose the language that they're comfortable with to write LSL applications. Um, and at the next level up, uh, there are already tons of applications out there that allow you, um, most importantly, to connect to devices, to connect to hardware, and to view and record data streams from that hardware. If you are a developer, there's also tons of example programs to show how to use LSL. It's a very simple uh, API, considering the complexity of what it does. And of course, we also have uh, wiki and documentation in various places. And this is kind of an overview of what constitutes LSL. Another way to look at LSL is this way. Um, LSL is, a, is, a, is what we call an overlay network. Uh, so it actually sits on top of a local area network and uh, LSL enabled programs, for example, something that connects to EEG hardware or some kind of stimulus uh, presentation um, or any other device that's LSNL, LSL enabled can send its data up into this uh, cloud. Um, this should say lab streaming, not lab steaming layer, but um, I didn't make this slide, so I, I get to um, point that out. Uh, and then at the other end, you have devices that do stuff with that data, uh, real-time viewers, uh, recording program, we've seen these two things. And you can also do online processing, and that's not a topic that we're going to cover much today, but this is something that people do a lot. And this is actually where I've done most of my work, is on this side. Um, today we're focusing more on offline applications, so recording and, uh, and offline analysis. Um, so. Uh, why did we go to the trouble of doing this? As I've said a few times, this was to enable mobile brain body imaging. Um, this is a concept that uh, Scott McKay came up with uh, quite some time ago. And the idea was, uh, Alex touched on this too, is to get people out of the lab and doing things in a more realistic context, get people moving around and see what their brain is doing when they do real world stuff like walking, looking, pointing, talking not just staring at a computer screen when they're sitting. Uh, and this is the core concept behind mobile brain body imaging. Um, and in this experiment, which Klaus Froman did, uh, he had somebody uh, wearing a um, high density EEG, uh, not just on the head, but also on the neck. So he was also looking at EMG from the neck muscles, uh, doing a orientation task. It was a simple task where you would look, walk, and point. And he was interesting in how the spectral power in different EEG channels corresponded to these walking and pointing events. And we used a motion capture system, actually an industrial quality one that's used in film production called Face Space, to uh, form a skeleton of the person's body. And we could look at the velocity of their point. We, of course, asked them to point in a very um, templated way so that they so we could we could spot the pointing action more easily um, but we could time lock our EEG analysis and our EMG analysis to the moments when they were um, actually moving and these are averages so we were able to reliably average across trials and this is the important thing this is the game that we want to play uh, and there is no way that this could have been done without LSL because there is no way we could have combined a mobile EEG system. And of course, now we can cut out the backpack and use a smaller device. But back then, this is what they were um, having to resort to. Uh, but uh, without LSL, this research would not have been possible. Um, another uh, thing I'd like to point out is that uh, Moby creates a lot of problems. The whole concept of mobile brain body imaging creates this problem because we're combining a lot of different modalities. And first of all, there's a format mess, um, meaning there's lots of different file formats. Uh, there's lots of different conversion functions we'll need to do. Oftentimes, we'll need custom strips in order to read and write extra files. 
And uh, this inevitably leads to a lot of missing or unreadable metadata, for example, channel labels, et cetera. Uh, the complex hardware time synchronization problem is one of the great problems of not only uh, um, neurophysiological research, um, but uh, computer human interaction in general. Uh, and actually my PhD in music was, was about doing this in the, in the musical domain. How do you, how do you synchronize events with, with, uh, with data streams? Uh, this is a very terrible problem. And this is something LSL tries to tackle. And what we want to get away from, of course, is a lot of different hardware and cabling, the, the so-called cable, cable spaghetti that I mentioned before, um, which makes it very easy to make mistakes. You have faulty wires, you have things coming loose, you have to have a soldering iron handy at all moments in order to do repairs. And this can very much irritate your test subjects. It can make setup time very, very long, laborious, things can go wrong. And it can also extend the pilot testing time for your experiment. So LSL is really trying to get around these problems. Uh, and then, of course, there's the uh, brittle, wacky post hoc synchronization solutions that people try to come up with, which can be very time consuming, for example, uh, going through video files and marking by hand which frames corresponding at which points in time things happen or trying to do some kind of autocorrelation. And these, these techniques in our experience never really worked very well. And this is another reason we tried to make LSL the way we did. Uh, just a couple other bonuses. Um, LSL tries to solve the error prone data collection problem uh, because of course the chance of failure increases with the number of devices, uh, data files, et cetera. And uh, it also, it was very important when we developed LSL to install a bunch of uh, safeguards against system failures. So I mentioned, I won't go into details, but uh, LSL does do data caching. So if you're doing a recording and you have to hot swap a dead battery, for example, or if a computer crashes, uh, LSL will, uh, if possible, will buffer uh, usually up to six minutes of data so if you have some kind of connection problem, you have this sort of six minute window in order to reconnect and none of that data will be lost. Um, this doesn't help you in a real time application, but if you're doing recordings and you don't wanna interrupt subjects, oftentimes uh, if they're doing a navigation task that they're concentrating, you want them to keep doing the task even if you lose a little bit of data. Uh, it, we want to uh, provide a way, again, flexibly unify tools for recording and viewing. Um, and of course, every vendor has a different interface or none. So LSL is a way to get data from a lot of different vendors. Um, and we're still working on that. We're still trying to convince everybody in the world that they should put an LSL button in their software or on their hardware device so that researchers can use it and take advantage of all the wearable devices and everything else that are coming out these days. Uh, along those lines, another early design goal for LSL was to be able to access uh, consumer grade technology. Um, uh, Tsi Peng Yong, who is one of the co-directors at the Sports Center for Computational Neuroscience had this concept of Moby in a box. So he wanted to do simultaneous recordings with, with hundreds of subjects at the same time. And uh, you, nobody can afford, uh, you know, a, a, um, 50,000 dollar EEG system 100 times over. Uh, well, maybe some people can, but um, this was a way to, to, to harness consumer grade technology to get data, maybe not great data, but lots of data. And there's a lot of interesting uh, questions you can answer, um, even if you're not using high precision equipment. Um, so a lot of these devices have APIs, meaning you can access their data in the software, but none of these devices has a, a TTL input. None of them has a trigger port. So it's not as if you can put a, a hardware trigger on these devices. Uh, nevertheless, some of these devices, the Connect Motion Capture System from Microsoft or the Leap Motion Hand Gesture Recognition System, 
are actually very interesting and can be used to answer some very interesting research questions. And uh, these are all LSL enabled devices. So to sum up the history of LSL, uh, I wanted to make the point that it was, even though it was meant for Mobi research, uh, by Mobi researchers, for Mobi researchers, it was designed with greater goals in mind. Uh, and it, I, I believe it's very useful for the following situations. So the one we're talking about today, of course, multimodal data experiments, or multimodal experiments where you combine different data types with different sampling rates, um, as various as F nearest in the EEG. It's also very good for hyperscanning. Uh, so if you have multiple subjects, even if they're using the same modality, you can fuse the uh, data and, and, and perform analyses looking at when things are happening at the same time due to the synchronization uh, capabilities. Uh, LSL is also quite good for BCI applications um, because part of what it does is send messages and data between devices. And this is something that you want at the output of the BCI. You want to be able to control a, a robot arm or a wheelchair or any other device with a classifier output. Uh, LSL, as I've also said, is good for incorporating consumer device data. And it's also very useful. Um, it can be used uh, for remote controlling experiments. The lab recorder program, which we just looked at very briefly, has a lot of features that's very powerful. And one of the features it has is a very sophisticated remote control uh, system. And this is useful, for example, in sleep studies and in infant studies when you're limited to the amount of interaction you can do with the subject. Uh, I, I think it's important to talk about the theory behind LSL. I won't talk about the guts of how it actually sends data back and forth and the asynchronous um, input output uh, network uh, transfer protocol um, models that it takes advantage of, but I did want to talk a little bit about synchronization. Um, so as we've seen, there are many different components to LSL and uh, just quickly going through this slide, um, and it seeks to solve many challenges in multimodal data acquisition. Um, but the most important theoretical consideration for now, I would say, is, is synchronization. So I just want to go through the theory of synchronization and LSL a little bit. It's important to understand because it can be done incorrectly. And it, understanding how it works is in, has implications as to how to use LSL. And uh, for example, to combine FNIRS and EEG, you need to do things a little bit different than if you want to combine EEG with motion capture. And this has to do with uh, data rate, it has to do with the, the actual structure of the devices and the software that controls them. There are a lot of different considerations. Um, so it's important to know a little bit about the synchronization procedures because it will affect your design choices. Um, and also LSL, is, it, it's not magical. And in the early days when I was basically spending all day supporting uh, brand new LSL users before there was a wide user base and a wide community supporting it, I got a lot of researchers who just thought that LSL would solve other problems and just greatly abused uh, the software because they didn't know what they were doing. And um, we had, we meaning the Swartz Center back then had maybe a little bit over promised how good LSL is. Um, so I, I always try to try to uh, uh, show a little bit about how it works so that people don't don't uh, shoot themselves in the foot. And uh, I've seen some terrible things where people did an entire study incorrectly and basically lost all their data because they misused things. Um, that was a long time ago. Things have gotten better. Um, uh, but it, the, the other thing is that this is actually quite simple. The way LSL works to synchronize data is pretty simple. So the basic idea is you timestamp everything. Every sample gets a timestamp. Every datum gets a timestamp. And you get the time from your computer. You can ask your computer for a, what's called system time. And on most computers, that's the number of seconds um, 
or the amount of time, I should say, since uh, January 1st, 1970 at Greenwich Mean Standard Time. So it's a big, big number. Um, but clocks drift and we have to synchronize them because that was a long time ago and the clocks may be quite inaccurate by now. Uh, so what you need to do is you need to measure time differences between connections. Um, and then you can use that information later to rebase the clock times between senders and receivers. And then you have synchronized data. Uh, you also will have to de-jitter uh, uh, the data timestamps. And I will simply show a picture of that instead of talking about it because I think it makes it um, it's pretty obvious what, what needs to be done there. And uh, I'll get to that later. So just to go back to this picture so we remember what's happening, on the left-hand side, uh, we have senders, basically. Uh, EEG hardware uh, triggers from a stimulus presentation, some other modality such as um, motion capture or indeed FNIRS, whatever. On the right-hand side, we have basically receivers, um, real-time viewers, a recording program, or some kind of online process. Um, now, the online process may actually send control signals back. It might be a receiver and a sender. But as I say, we're focused in mainly on this today. So there is, it's a one-way communication. So this is an abstract view of uh, a possible set up with LSL. Um, you have your EEG, uh, in this case, Brain Products Live App connector app on one computer, call it PC1, and that has an LSL signal outlet. It's sending data. Uh, and we also have a mouse connector app, um, which is sending markers. It's sending uh, button events from the mouse, and we can put that on a different PC, call it PC2. On a third computer, we have the recorder. And the lab recorder app has an inlet for uh, each data stream that it's connected to. In this case, there's a signal inlet for the live amp and a marker inlet for the uh, mouse button events. And it's receiving data and it will uh, write that data to an XDF file. And there's a certain format and it'll write a block of signal and signal and then it gets a marker and it writes a marker and just it writes data so we can read it later. Um, at the same time, though, the Lab Recorder app, which, as I say, is very powerful, is also calculating clock offsets. So every now and then, it's, it's, it's asking for what the clock difference is between uh, itself and PC1 and also itself and PC2. And these might be very different. Um, and as it writes the data, uh, it's also writing down clock offsets into the file. And we will use these clock offsets later when we load the data to synchronize. And don't worry, when I say we will do it, I mean the LSL loading application will do it. We don't have to do it ourselves. It will happen automatically. But this is how it works. To give you a better idea of this process, let me show you this picture. Uh, so how does it synchronize? It, needs to correct for the clock offsets between uh, different PCs. And if you're just using one PC, this is a very, very small offset. It'll be on the order of microseconds, and it's, it doesn't really matter. But a lot of times, if you're using a lot of different uh, high-quality um, devices, you will be forced to use different PCs, and this will become a serious problem uh, that LSL will solve. Uh, this is a tried and true method. It's actually um, called the clock filter algorithm, and it's been around since uh, the dawn of the internet. And it works the following way. From your inlet, at time zero, you send a packet to the outlet, from the receiver to the sender, that is. Uh, at some point in the future from that moment, at T1, the receiver will, will receive that uh, um, packet, and it will note the time. As soon as may be, as soon as possible, it will send another time packet back to the inlet and we'll call that time T2. And at time three, the receiver will uh, uh, get the packet. So we have four times, T0, 1, 2, and 3, um, that correspond to these moments in time. 
And there's a very simple uh, arithmetic um, uh, expression that calculates the RTT, the round trip time. And these are the clock offsets between the recording app and the data streaming app. Um, again, uh, we can use these values to basically map the time base of this PC onto the time base of this PC. It's a kind of virtual uh, master slaving. So in essence, what we're doing is we're forcing this PC's clock to be the same as this one, at least at, uh, at the time we load the data. And this is very simple, of course. Everybody can understand this immediately. It's a simple arithmetic expression. Uh, this part is actually extremely complicated. How do we remap it? Well, as I mentioned, we don't have to actually do that. Uh, LSL will do that for us. LSL has loading programs uh, in MATLAB and Python, which uh, give exactly the same results when they load an XDF file. And uh, you can uh, perform your analysis using uh, raw code in MATLAB or Python, um, but there are also a number of analysis packages um, notably EEG Lab uh, for MATLAB and MNE Lab for Python that take advantage of this um, software and do all of this process for you. It's automatic. Um, now, of course, data from research-grade data acquisition devices, such as those manufactured by Nyrex and Brain Products, is very reliably timed. When it says the sampling rate is 11 hertz or 500 hertz or whatever, you can be quite sure that that is in fact the sampling rate. Um, but uh, no two clocks are exactly alike. Hardware clocks are always a little bit off. So even if you have two devices from the same manufacturer, they both say that they're working at 500 Hertz. One might actually be at 499.99 Hertz and the other might be at 500.001 Hertz. And this is different. Um, and so you might have to uh, accommodate for this. Worse than that, actually, when LSL does its thing where it writes data to file and simultaneously fetches all this timestamp information, this actually reduces the clock reliability in the software. So even though the hardware is, develop is delivering time uh, series very reliably and steadily, when LSL gets its hand on it, it mangles that, especially on Windows. Windows is very bad at timing. So what you get is jitter. LSL actually adds jitter to your EEG or your FNIRS data, uh, meaning that subsequent time samples are not evenly spaced in time. And worse than that, they might not even be monotonic. And to show that, uh, I'll show you a picture of uh, uh, inter-sample times from two signals. Uh, one was recorded from a Linux device, one was recorded from a Windows device. In fact, it's the data that I was recording in that uh, quick uh, toy experiment I set up before. Uh, the blue line is the inter-sample time, so the difference in timestamps between successive samples in the data coming from the uh, brain vision recorder after it's been uh, uh, forwarded to LSL. And the red line, which is quite small, but you can I hopefully see on your, on your screens that it is kind of noisy, it's, it's jittering, much less than the blue line from the Windows um, device. Uh, and, but this is also not steady. And you can also see that the uh, Windows timestamps are not at all monotonic. Some of them are negative, meaning some timestamps are actually uh, um, have a lower value than the time after them. They're actually backwards in time. So you have to correct for this. And LSL loading programs do this as well, and they do it automatically. And so you see here, this is the before and this is the after. So the blue line was about 500 hertz, and you see afterwards the subsequent samples are all exactly two milliseconds apart. The red line is supposed to be 250 hertz, but it was a it was it was um, just a uh, sample program. This wasn't from actual hardware; it was just a little Python script, so it wasn't exact. And uh, it was supposed to be 250 hertz, and it's a little more than 
four milliseconds between each timestamp. Um, but the good thing is this is exactly steady, right? This is completely de-jittered. And you can see the standard deviation uh, is greatly reduced. So in here, it's on the order of uh, 1.9 milliseconds. And here, it's very, 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 very small. So going back to our, um, our blah epoch, uh, I just wanted to focus on this part right here and make a final point about LSL and time. Because a lot of times researchers are used to, at least coming from brain products, um, researchers are used to having their triggers in as part of the hardware, right? The triggers are hardware triggers. Every time you send a trigger to the device, it corresponds exactly in time with one of the samples from that device. It corresponds exactly in time to a measurement, a single digital sample measurement of a voltage in the EEG. This isn't exactly how LSL works. So if I take a close-up of this, you'll see what I mean. This is the same thing, it's just zoomed in around time zero. So time zero, the black vertical line is the marker um, corresponding to the blah events that I was sending before. And the blue line is the random data from my Linux computer, and the red line is the uh, simulated EEG, which was assigned years ago. Now, if you notice, the data points do not line up exactly with the marker, and they never will in LSL, unless you do some kind of interpolation. LSL does not do that for you. So what do we mean when we say they're synchronized? Because they're not commensurate. And remember, this signal is about 250 hertz, and this one is about 500 hertz. We see there are roughly two data points per one data point. So yeah, that's good. Um, but this data point, for example, does not line up with this data point, and neither of them line up exactly with this uh, time zero. Um, but what we can do, if we need to know exactly, is we can do some kind of linear interpolation, uh, weighted linear interpolation to find that point. Uh, and if we do find that point, and we do find this point in the other data stream, uh, we can say those values at those points occurred at the same moment in time. And this is what LSL does. And it's been validated to, and it's been shown that markers and data streams are accurate within one millisecond. And I don't want to go into the details of how we validated that, but there's a link here and you can look at the experiments that were done to show that this is indeed working properly. So that researchers can rely on this time information and they can do averages across trials and they can believe that the results that they're getting are in fact the reality of the situation. Uh, and what this enables you to do is to do uh, event-related analyses across multiple data streams, which is hopefully um, what, uh, for the purposes of this webinar, we, we should be able to do. Um, this is uh, near the end of my talk, uh, which is good, because I think we're getting to um, a good stopping point. Um, so I'll just, I'll just finally say again, LSL is, LSL is very flexible. It's complicated, there's a learning curve indeed, um, but it is a great way to do this kind of research and across different modalities. Another bonus of LSL is it works over a network, which means we can unify data from different PCs without any trouble. Uh, data transmission is easy and we can synchronize between PCs without any uh, thought. Uh, we, can just, we can just trust it to work. And, and LSL is also reliable. It's popular, it's being used by a lot of different researchers. Um, there are research projects going on at DARPA right now that are using LSL. NASA is doing projects that involve LSL. Uh, the Swartz Center is a leader in these kinds of high engineering uh, biophysiological experiments and they use it extensively as well. There's a lot of uh, uh, activity around LSL right now. And uh, just recently, we applied for a CZI grant. That's the Chong Zuckerberg Initiative. And we have a lot of things on the roadmap that we'd like to do. Um, one thing that's really important, I think, is that we want to uh, put LSL into embedded and Internet of Things devices to harness this uh, wealth of, of consumer devices that are uh, giving us all kinds of uh, meaningful data that we can use in our experience. And I, I'm going to argue um, that LSL just works. 
And uh, with that, uh, I uh, have one more slide with a bunch of links on it. Um, hopefully, uh, these slides will make it to uh, the hands of all the people who want them and that this talk is being recorded and they can come back and reference these. And I thank you for your attention and I will turn it over to the next presenter. Thank you so much, David. Um, this was really, really very comprehensive. Thank you. Um, we were just wondering, so how are you with time? Because we have uh, the practical part right now and should we have a first round of questions for you immediately or can you join us till the end of the webinar? Uh, I can join till the end of the, the webinar and mm -hmm. I, I, I would like to because I want to see the next part. Uh -huh, okay, okay, so, fantastic. Uh, um, if people want to ask questions now, that's fine, but uh, I'm, I, I would like to stick around anyway, so. Okay. Um, uh, all attendees are very welcome to type in their questions. So you see there is, uh, there is a question box. Please uh, feel free to type in and we will address all the questions at the end. Uh, for the moment, we have now Made. So we, she has prepared an experiment, a practical experiment. Everything basically that David mentioned, we will put it into practice. And Made will first explain you the setup. She will guide you through exactly what kind of experiment we are doing and uh, show you basically uh, all the, the protocols and all the devices that we are using. And then we are going to do it. Um, uh, we are going to show you how it, how it looks. So Made, when you're ready, please. Yeah. Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, thank you a lot, David, for your for your uh, comprehensive um, talk on the LSL. And actually, what I'm going to show you right now it's exactly what you tell in the last slide. So it really works, and we are going to show that it's pretty easy. Uh, so let's uh, start. So the first part, so what we are using today, so we are using as a stimuli, uh, we are using Psychopi. And we're going to do a checkerboard experiment. So you're just going to flick. It's going to be a flicker board uh, in, our, in our subject. Sorry. Uh, for the EEG part, we are going to use the live amp, which is a wireless uh, EEG device from uh, Brain Products. And for the FNIRS, we are going to use also our wireless device. So it's going to be the NIRS part two, which is over there. And we're going to integrate all of this through LSL and we are going to have the integrated acquisition. So my computer will be uh, ac acquiring the data from FNIRS and EEG and my colleague Blanca over there, she will be using the PsychoPy to show the experiment. Um, if you want to have more information, so we have a press release in, joined with the uh, Brain Products. Uh, we showed more in depth of this setup. And also feel free to email us if you have any questions. For the cap montage, so one interesting thing that also uh, Alex and David also mentioned is that you sh should be able to freely uh, set up your cap montage, right? So we have here the near site, which you already know. And in the near site, you can also put your electrode. So here we have a 32 electrodes configuration in a 16 by 16 uh, optode, so 16 sources, 16 detectors. Because we are doing a checkerboard, so we are mostly looking at the occipital area for the vision. We have here an occipital montage, and we also put a motor montage, so you can see that's very flexible, and you can ch change this uh, according to your experiment. So here you can see we have some optodes and electrodes in the same area, so we get the same area at the same time. So just one last slide before we go. So just the data acquisition software. So we have here the Aurora software, which is the NIRS part two, which already has the LSL included. So the LSL uh, here, we can stream data and also receive the trigger. So it will all be saved together. And for the live amp, we use the brain vision recorder just for the impedance check. We already did some impedance measurements before just for the sake of the time. Uh, but it was pretty easy also to do. And then we will have the live amp connector, as David showed, just to connect the LSL and the live amp. We will just show the LSL viewer, which is actually this print I have here. And we can see the trigger display up down here. And then we will record everything with the lab recorder. Uh, there is also, an, in this link down here, there is also a really nice page showing step-by-step uh, -step everything uh, we are going to show right now. So. Let's go and 
see our our colleague sense so we are ready there okay i will um turn on the the light lamp there Okay, so the live lamp is turned on, near sport, it's turned on. Let's, we will try to, to zoom in with a different webcam. Uh, so maybe you can try to show. Yeah. Let's, I will try to share my mm -hmm. webcam here. Okay. Oh, uh, let's choose the other one. Okay. So yeah, you can I'll do that. Yes. Okay. So I'll try. So we are connecting to the live amp right now uh, via Bluetooth, and we are gonna check the impedances. Let's check here with the recorder so we can check. <clears throat> Okay, as I told you, we already did, uh, we prepared the, the subject beforehand. So you can see that all impedances are pretty good, below 10K. We have one here that's 36. Um, if you, okay, if you want, you can, I can adjust it. Which one is it? CP1. Anything else? No, that was the only one. So, yeah, so then, good. Okay, so now we are ready with our EEG side, which is everything good. We can stop the live recorder here. Connect, turn off. Here you can see um, the, the active electrodes yeah. interpolated to the optodes. As according to the voltage that Nade uh, already showed. Okay, I think that's pretty clear. Yes, so you can see the, the whole voltage there. And we can go to the F nearest part mm -hmm. to check the data. Let's do that. So the optodes, so the optodes are positioned, the 32 electrodes are all over. Uh, the cortex and uh, according to the voltage matter design, the optodes are over the motor cortex, as you can see here, and over the occipital cortex because we're going to do a visual experiment. So, yeah, so here we have the voltage I just showed you, and we're going to do signal optimization right now for the, so we just did the impedance for the EEG part, and we're going to do the signal optimization for the f nearest part, so as you already know, we are shining light into the brain, and this we're going now. We are just um, optimizing each of the sources to get uh, the best uh, signal in our detectors. So one of the questions that we received a lot is that if FNIRS works with uh, people with darker hair or a bit darker skin. So as you can see. Our friend here, that's really possible. So you can see the, the light is it's good. We have a nice signal optimization. Okay, before we go ahead, let me open the let me connect here the so we have the live amp connecting as David showed. So we can just turn on. So all of this I downloaded from the, the GitHub that David showed and I just put it here in my desktop for for easiness, and that's something you can also do. So I just gonna scan for the device again. Um, here you can put your channel labels. That's uh, I did everything beforehand. Also, just scanning the device. Okay. So here the device is here. We can link it. All good, 32 channels, um, yeah. Okay, so this part is done. And now we're, we can check the, the signal using the brain vision LSL. 
So let's just check to see if everything is okay. We can, um, we can, ah, it's already there. Okay, so when we connect here, uh, we already have uh, Blanca streaming from her other, from her other computer. We have her already streaming some data. So we, gonna use this right now, the trigger stream. It's what we, she's streaming from LSL, from PsychoPy. Okay, so let's just click here. Okay, so here you can see a really good EEG data. You can check for, for um, FP1 and FP2, just to see the blinking eyes, and you, you can check that. So we can see nice EEG data. All right. We could see if you what uh, also David showed, so you can see an FFT online here. He's not doing anything right now. And just for the last part, so we don't miss it, we have to record all our data, right? So let's just open the lab recorder here. Perfect. And then in the lab recorder, we can choose all the streams that we want. For 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 this experiment, we are gonna save them the the live amp, uh, this one here, and then the trigger stream, which is the one being streamed from PsychoPy. Let's just start saving this here. Uh, just to clarify, so right now we are using two different computers. One is Blanca's laptop uh, connected via Wi-Fi to hotspot, and uh, that computer is using is running PsychoPy. And we have Mali's computer running both the near software and the EEG software. Exactly. So this is just practical, you know, for practical reasons, you can also have three completely different uh, laptops to run all three softwares independently so that, uh, you know, uh, it's enough that they are connected to the same network. Exactly. Um, okay, so I'm going to start the... Oh. Uh, well, please go ahead. Yep. yep. Oh, sorry. Let's collect some baseline before yep. running the experiment. Let's start the here, the FNIRS data. Okay, so you can see the FNIRS data is also really good. Let's see some of the ripples that we are used to when looking at FNIRS data. So this is just nice. We can do a low pass filtering. Mm -hmm. So we can see the block average later. Okay, so the so here we are already recording the EEG signal, and we can, we can start, start recording. Yeah, we can start. So I can show here. Okay, so you can see the. Uh, the no. Yeah, no, <laughs> nothing yet. Yeah, just the baseline. This is. But you will see the checkerboard on the on the. Yeah, then you can see the first trigger there and the checkerboard, and we can also check here on our LSL viewer. Yes, and we are receiving triggers here on the bottom part, if you look. So we, these are the triggers that we are receiving from, from PsychoPy. And the camera seems to be blocked. Yeah. Too much for that. <laughs> so again, here you can see the you can see the LSL streams, and you can see the Aurora software all gathering data at the same time. And that's pretty much what you have to do when doing uh, FNIRS EG combine. So as you can see, it's a uh, pretty simple setup. You just uh, need to download the softwares and once you have everything on your desktop, you just really click and start. So right now we are already getting, we can see a bit of the block averages here. So because uh, Aurora is able to receive triggers from uh, LSL, we can see some online uh, block average already. So we can see a pretty nice activation here uh, for our colleague sense. Uh, how many markers? How many blocks? Is it three? Yeah, we have three three mm -hmm. blocks here. So, and uh, just one marker. So for the F news, we're just marking actually the start of the checkerboard, and then that's it. For the EG, of course, there is one marker for every time the board border um, 
changes. So you can really see, you can really analyze it. Uh, for combined experiments, we you will always have to adjust the paradigm, right? So normally for EEG, if you run VEPs, you don't have to do a block design. You would just have alternating check reports. But here we redesigned it slightly. So we have blocks of, I think, 10 seconds where we have alternating checkerboards and then we have a rest uh, that's the class at the same time. And of course, the correct trigger for EEG is uh, the alternating checkerboard while the right trigger, as Matt said, for the nears is actually the beginning of the block. And these are the block averages that you are seeing. Exactly. So that's, that's, uh, so that's pretty much it. I uh, can... Uh, we can maybe show the 3D view and see yeah, some uh, activation if, if we happen, you know, during the, if, if we can see. Exactly. You can see here the 3D view from... So, uh, yeah, maybe we adjust a little bit the sensitivity because maybe we can even see some activation real time on single trial. Sometimes is sometimes you have to average, but sometimes it actually isn't strong enough that it can be seen really. Yeah, yeah you can see some here. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So with a little delay, so the, the checkerboard is already gone, but this is it. Yeah. And we actually see the activation only or most in the occipital part and not in the motor part. So here you can see the trigger and then some activation afterwards, which is what we expected from this uh, experiment. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, you have all the, the views that you already used to in Aurora. So you have the line plot. You can also see the topo plot. So that's exactly what we saw before, the 3D. And now the block averages. Sure. So I think the experiment is almost over, right? How many yeah. blocks do we yeah. have? Yeah, we, are, we have eight already. Mm -hmm. So two more. Yeah. Two more. Uh, but that's pretty much it, right, Mandy? You wanted to show the simplicity of the setup. Yeah, exactly. So, and, um, and, and also, I mean, we can also show here the, the data afterwards, so you know that's also pretty easy to, to load your data afterwards if you want to. So here is the... Just one more block. It stopped. Okay. 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 So we can stop here the smears and then we go to the lab recorder. We can stop the recording here. Okay, that's it. Here we can stop, disconnect. Okay. The nearest data is saved by Aurora with the newest version in .nears, but also in the in the .snurf, which is the newest format uh, file. And uh, in both file types, the triggers are, of course, the, L the triggers received by LSL are, of course, stored within the file. And in uh, through the lab recorder, it's stored in the XDF, right, Mate? Exactly. So here you can see today's day 11. So New York's data is here. Uh, like Lamia said, it's also already uh, saved in the NIRS format and SNIRF, SNIRF format. And the trigger, you can see it's here. So it's everything it's saved already. For the, for the EEG data, it's then uh, saved here. So it's then saved here, as you can see, uh, the data it's already here. And you can also load your your EEG data from here. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So you can load using the this load XDF format, and it's already loaded here from a experiment, but it's already here. You can see uh, in the info, you can see the trigger that's been loaded, and you can also see here the, the live amp data. So it's pretty much uh, simple. Here you can see the time series. So here's all your, your EEG data saved in a matrix format. In, so that's pretty much it. So that's all the EEG and FNIRS data that you would need to then go to your analysis uh, part. And we can maybe, so in the next webinar, we can exactly take a look at this data. Exactly. And see yeah. how it works. Exactly. In the meanwhile, I would say we can release our patient subject. Who yeah. for, thank, thank you very much <laughs> yeah, for, your, for all your patience and being here with us. Um, yeah. You can turn off uh, Aurora. Can turn off. Can I? Yeah. Off Aurora. Yeah.
Let me help you. <laughs> okay. You can maybe turn off this camera. There is no need. Okay. Uh, okay, perfect. I think we have received some questions, so a lot of them. Okay. Um, uh, so, uh, David, I hope you are still here. <laughs> Yes, I am still here. Okay, okay, yeah. perfect. Yes, we can hear you, we don't see you. Oh, yeah, I, I turned my camera and, and sound ah, okay. off. And, uh... Perfect. Uh, okay, so one, uh, the first question. Um, what is the perspective of LSL in the future when it comes to going outside of brain imaging? So we, we actually, the two of us, we spoke about this a little bit briefly a, a few weeks ago. So it seems to be very popular in the brain imaging field, but when you start synchronizing, especially if you want to add some physiological measurements and maybe to extract, you know, to, to try to clean, to regress out some physiological information out of your near signal, for example. Uh, how do you uh -huh. see it, um, you know, becoming more popular outside of brain imaging? Uh, I think it already is. Um, there's a lot of, in the early days, eye tracking and motion capture seemed to be what most people were interested in. Uh, mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of, there's a lot of eye trackers and motion capture devices that um, uh, adopted LSL quite early on, as, as long as uh, six or seven years ago. Uh, and they've all stayed with it. Uh, lately, I've seen more devices, for example, um, Flux and Vitalino, which are sort of general purpose uh, uh, physiological data acquisition hardware. You know, they can do GSR, they can do, they even have a one channel FNIRS uh, thing and a one channel EEG connection. Um, they have really excellent LSL connectivity. Um, but I think will be the next, the next step that we need to take is to get the so-called Internet of Things involved. Um, so we're really trying to push to get LSL going really well on embedded devices so that it can run without a computer. Um, LSL relies currently very heavily on the operating system, on the infrastructure of Windows and Linux, et cetera, to organize memory and to send network packets and things like this. In principle, though, it's possible to do this directly from uh, many devices. Uh, uh, already, we can do it on Android and, and iOS, but even on like my my uh, Garmin sports watch, for example, um, technically it's possible to send LSL triggers uh, because it has Bluetooth and it has a Cortex uh, uh, processor in it. Um, but we need to we need to improve the library to make that easier for manufacturers, and this is something we're really pushing for in the next couple of years with our roadmap. And I think when that happens, you'll start to see a lot more interest. And I think manufacturers will start competing for each other. Uh, it, you really saw this in eye trackers about five years ago, where every eye tracking company had to have LSL because it was something that some of the established companies were doing. And I think once you start to see that in uh, more consumer technology, um, you'll be able to get, you know, I'm sorry, you can't see the, can't line it up. Uh, heart rate and, and heart rate variability and these kinds of measures just really easy. And that'll be mm -hmm. nice. Yeah, definitely. Sound, sounds really exciting. So we are looking forward to, you know, uh, for, for this to gain a little more, more momentum in other, uh, in other fields. Uh, next question, uh, is there a starting guide for LSL? Sounds like the wiki is the right place. So if you were a beginner, where would you start from? Uh, one of the links I provided um, has uh, a, a, um, a getting started section. Um, and I would start there. It's, it's kind of hard to just start from scratch, unfortunately. And part of that is because there's so many different things you can do it really depends on what you're trying to do for somebody to say, oh, well, if you want to do that with LSL, then you should do this. But if your idea is just, well, how do I start with LSL? It's kind of like, well, how do I start with, I don't know, uh, EEG, you know? Um, there is, a, but as I said, the read the docs uh, link does have a getting started section and 
I think the list of supported devices is a good place to start because chances are you have something already that's LSL enabled and you can kind of uh, start playing around with the viewer and a recorder and um, you can use some of these great open source tools for doing analysis like EEG lab and ME lab to look at the data and play with it. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I would start there. The read the the read the docs link. I, is there a way for me to to pop it up somehow? Can I put it in the chat or? Uh, there are um, there is like a slide. Um, you can share slides. I don't know if you see the there is like a box where you can drop uh, slides. I think you can drop any file. Mm. No. I see type met I'm sorry. I see type messages. It, if it's not the problem, we can send it out. You know, we can uh, when we when we publish the video, we can send out the slides and everything to to all attendees. So no no worries about that. Too. Okay, I apologize for my technical challenges. Maybe I remember wrong. You know, maybe it's not possible at all. So <laughs> I'm not sure. Um. Uh, okay, I just want because there are there is, seems to be a lot of interest, many more questions. I just want to because we are a little bit over time. I just want to make sure you are fine thinking maybe 15 more minutes so we can address a few more questions. Yeah. Okay. No problem. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, so the next question is from a user who has um, a similar setup to what we use today. So basically, they have uh, Brain Products EG, they have a Nurex Nairis system, and then they have a Biopack for physi physiological recording. However, Biopex uh, acknowledge software is not supported for LSL. They are asking for advice, and they also use PsychoPy for experimental paradigm ascending triggers. So basically, the one part, which is the physiological uh, measurements from Biopex, are, are not synchronized via LSL. Any work around there? I, I'm, I'm not familiar with Biopex. Uh, so I'm 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 not sure I can give a very cohesive answer to that. Um, if Biopack has an SDK or some kind of way you can uh, um, access the data in, in in one of these languages like Python or MATLAB, that's more familiar to most researchers. Uh, mm -hmm. It might be very simple actually to just um, by hand to to add an LSL like something that forwards to LSL. Um, that's pretty simple to do uh, without a without a great deal of programming experience. Um, not obviously not everybody can can just dive in and do that, but um, if there is any kind of API that comes with your device, uh, and most manufacturers do have an SDK, um, the the example programs that come with LSL for its various APIs and and the Python one is very good, especially MATLAB works very well. Um, well, they all work very well, but the Python one is especially easy. Um, so if, if Biopack has any kind of Python API, then it would not be very hard to, 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 to add an LSL connector. That is great to know for other, for other devices as well. So uh, as you said, not many support, especially for physiological measurements, not many of them support LSL, but many of them do have uh, some kind of SDK, so it means that there is some hope, right, for even for yeah. devices. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, okay, perfect. So the next one, uh, first of all, very uh, fantastic feedback. Thanks so much for the also webinar introduction. The question is about a possible bandwidth limit. So, uh, for example, today we did EEG 32 channels and one year's device with only 16 and 16 uploads. We can have multiple devices, you know, we can have 48, 48, we can have uh, even, you know, hundreds of channels uh, across several subjects uh, streamed real time. Is there any limit when it comes to LSL as to bandwidth? Um, yes, yeah, of course. Uh, it's quite high. Um, and in most cases, actually, networking hardware has a lower bandwidth than LSL does. So um, LSL is actually quite lightweight from a software point of view. Um, and I've done experiments. It can't handle something as high as, um, uh, uh, you know, the current state-of-the-art video, for example, with, with surround sound audio is, you know, hundreds of megabytes per second. Or so if you want to stream that 
Um, LSL is not going to be able to handle that, but you can easily send, you know, at the sports center, we, we had experiments where we would run two subjects at the same time with 256 channels of EEG, markers coming from 14 different computers recording audio uh, all at the same time. And the, the, the bottleneck was really the hardware. Um, and another gotcha is Bluetooth. Bluetooth interference can, can ruin your day. Um, mm -hmm. So you can have five devices uh, connected that only have one or two channels at a low sampling rate via Bluetooth and Bluetooth will hop between uh, its bands and its spectrum and you will drop samples all over the place. Um, so I would say LSL, you, you have to try to push the limits of bandwidth, but uh, other factors that are part of life will, will limit you. If, if I translate this to the exact example of NEARS, for example, you know, with NEARS we have relatively low sampling rate as compared to EEG, and yeah. also we connect via Wi-Fi, so it's gonna, we don't use the Bluetooth. So I, I can yeah. imagine that you know, we can have a reasonable amount of subjects with, with a relatively high number of channels without any issues, without reaching the bandwidth of, of LSL. Yeah, I think I think you're you're gonna hit the bandwidth of your of your wireless router long before you'll hit the bandwidth of mm -hmm. Okay, 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 perfect. Um, so here is a question that we can address. Uh, so if uh, optodes and our electrodes were placed based on 10, 10, and 10, 20 system, correct? So we first uh, place the 32 EG optodes, uh, sorry, EG electrodes, uh, and then we intercalated um, uh, the optodes in between. Uh, Mada, are there any, um, maybe you can mention the equidistant montage or you can, if there, if there were some special considerations that you took when you designed the montage? Yeah, so importantly is that you try to get on the, the same place that you're getting your, your electrode, you try to surround it with your optodes. So you can get the same, more or less the same area, right? So the, the electrode will get the, the, the brain area just direct, directly under the, the electrode and the optode will get the light path. So that's something important when you are when you are designing your cap. And for this one, we use the 32 channels in the 1020 systems and we use the, the other channels surrounding for the, for the optodes. But as Lamia mentioned, we also have a equidistance cap which is actually uh, more optimized for doing this kind of measurement, EG and FNIRS together, because you have your EG in the 32 positions, and then you can have the equidistant caps for the, for the FNIRS. So you can keep your three centimeters uh, distance all over the cortex, which would be more optimal in this case. But for this specific montage, we use 10 to 20, yes. Um, okay, so the next question also very interesting. I think it's for everyone who wants to chime in. Uh, so basically this user uh, is saying that they are having EEG, fMRI and NIRS. But the question is if they get extra hemodynamic information with integration of EEG with uh, fNIRS better than uh, fMRI, they work with mixed paradigm and not block paradigm. Maybe I can start by stating my humble opinion, and then uh, I don't know if someone else from the group wants to join in. Uh, so um, FNIRS, of course, is not fMRI and will never have the special resolution that fMRI has, no the penetration depth. Having said so, you do have two signals, two independent signals. They are, they are, uh, there is correlation, but for every channel, you do, the, you do get the time course of oxy and the time course of deoxy. Furthermore, you get this signal uh, at a much higher sampling rate than the bolt signal in fMRI, and there may be some extra information in there. Uh, I am not sure if the advantage, uh, if I understand this question correctly, but I don't see any advantage um, or difference uh, if whether we work with the mixed paradigm or the block paradigm. Uh, is there anyone, David, do you want to comment? I know it's not an LSL question, but everyone also, uh, everyone from our team, please feel free to chime in if you have, uh, if you want to comment on this. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't probably have anything um, very, very, very meaningful to say on this topic, I'm afraid. I see Patrick is ready. Yeah, so please. <laughs> I think I would know a lot more about that. Uh, ready and, and, and an enthusiast about the topic. This is why I thought I, I pop in. Um, 
you have more information than in just so so the MR, the MRI basically measures uh, how much of the signal is decaying by by change in magnetic property which happens by the deoxyhemoglobin doing something to it the near signal is fundamentally measuring with two wavelengths and we have two unknowns that we solve for two uh, numbers that we're getting so we have two informations and those informations are not the same so we are getting some more information and it's i would say it's just at the beginning to understand how we, we are looking at this hemodynamic response function that we you know derived somewhere from a curve from a from a, a monkey visual cortex and then yes elaborated that somewhat more but there is more and if you look closely to the oxy and deoxy on a, on a block design you will see that they have a little time delay in there so there's information in there and if you do derivatives like the total and and, and a ratio and something like that those have also information independent information which means they are not fully correlated or not even linear dependent on each other so we get more information that's the one thing the other thing is that the typical higher sampling rate of the f nears is giving an advantage and i say typical because yes you can drive fmri really really fast if you just image a little region of interest but typically you record uh, at a much higher sampling rate which gives you something like the heartbeat which is otherwise you randomly sample somewhere in the artifact with the fmri and this is just noise on your data and this noise can be modeled and regressed out and this is why you get the cleaner signal it doesn't matter if you can just collect more trials and average them then you obviously also get rid of it but if you do stuff like single trial uh, work there's no way of of creating more um you know this, this this is your best way recording best possible data and maybe lastly there was the the limitation that fnius is not going deep that is true we are not just light doesn't get that deep um and even if we put more light in and use even finer sensors we can use a little bit and there's the idea of doing tomography but you will not get to the deep structures amygdala whatever however we also find whenever then the, the, if you talk to an ethnius researcher more often than not they say yeah we're interested in whatever type of processing however we find the response also in some other regions than you would typically look and then you just have to see the regions that are either affected or affecting the region that you're interested in the deeper structures i hope that answers some of the question so yes Fantastic. you get additional information and and Patrick, please stay tuned because i think you you're you're you will want to address the next question as well <laughs> so, uh, there are actually two two very similar questions and this is how we opened the, the webinar but um you know, some users would like to know more about uh, basically complementarity of eeg and fnirs so what is is fnirs showing something that eeg cannot and uh, basically they are asking for help to convince other researchers about the you know the <laughs> advantages of the combination okay yes absolutely love to comment on that so the, the the simplest example is if you do if you do your classical eeg analysis and then you go to wavelets and with the wavelets you can discriminate if something if an activity is creating phase locking phase locking factor which means i have an oscillatory event going on and i have some sort of a phase reset due to a stimulus I show a picture and just resets that and because i have the same type of oscillation going on but I'm shifting the phase something somewhat, I'm getting an additional potential. So I'm averaging together and I see an activity. And now I could, if I don't know about the wavelets, I would say, was that actually happening or wasn't this happening? So was there additional energy or was it, you know, an additional event or was it just a phase reset? If it was just a phase reset, it could well be that it just takes the very same energy all the time. A brain area takes the very same energy all the time. We don't have any F. MRI or FNIS signal. However, we do, because it synchronizes, same activity, but synchronized, we do see an, FM, uh, an EEG signal, an ERP. Okay, I can answer that by using wavelets. I can really tell apart whether I have synchronized activity or, you know, a phase reset, or if I have an increase in energy, more oscillation, if you will. But this is this is one way. I take a complete different approach, just the geometry. If I have a, a source pointing that way, I do see it in my EEG. If I have the source pointing anywhere perpendicular to that, 
I don't see it. I see it in the MEG, but I don't see it in the EEG. Obviously, there's activity going on and it's on and it's going up and down, and this activity cannot be seen in the EEG, and obviously it could create an FNIR signal. So from the oscillatory nature of the brain activity, the electric brain activity, we can derive directly that there's activity that will be visible in FNIRs and fMRI. And from the geometry of cells, we can say directly derive that there's activity that will be visible in the fMRI or fNIRs, but not in the EEG. This is, this is, let's say, there's fundamentals why the one shows up and the other doesn't. And then the value of it is, as I said at the very beginning, is more than just being able to explain. I, I, I make a, I make a very a different example. If you would do an fMRI of somebody sleeping, which is done for eight hours, it gets very jumbled data and doesn't make much sense. If I'm adding an EEG to it and I'm able to put it into certain sleep phases, then I'm suddenly explaining variance. It's not eight hours of I don't know, it's eight hours broken down in certain sleep phases. And if I then do the fMRI group within my sleep phases, suddenly they make a lot of sense. I can calculate network, um, you know, connectivity and that tell how that looks for us through various sleep stages. And now don't think about sleep because sleep, it comes natural to us to know. We all have heard about the sleep phases in the EEG. Use the EEG or the FNIRS to break down the variants of your other signal into blocks you understand. And suddenly it's not error variants anymore, but it's explained and it helps you understand what's happening. Uh, there is a question related to that. Basically, uh, you, you explained very well the advantage and uh, the question is about potential clinical relevance. So are there any validated uh, clinical applications of the integration? Um, while you think of it, maybe I can mention that uh, I don't know of any validated, maybe someone else knows something, but there is a lot of use in BCI, so uh, not, not for the clinical application, but uh, there, uh, you, you can work in two different ways. So you can maybe increase the number of parameters, the number of commands that you want to decode, or uh, you can increase the accuracy of your classifier. So there are several studies that prove the advantages of combining in the field of BCI. Another field where there is a lot of research with uh, the integrated modalities is epilepsy. So long-term like monitoring for eight hours where they are, uh, I think they are called interictal discharges, where they try uh, with, with uh, EEG, they can uh, record the spikes and then with when they, in, in the exact time points where they see those interictal discharges, they can go look for the hemodynamic activation map. But this is again all, all research. So as, um, uh, as far as I'm at least aware, at the moment, there are no clinical, uh, clinically validated applications. Okay. Okay. Second, uh, uh, I just like to... Please, please. Uh, yes. Sorry, should we move along? Or should, I, I just want to, to generalize. Um, Patrick, Patrick already made this point, but uh, there's a lot of noise in these signals. And sometimes we don't know if it's noise or not. And the signals can complement each other and let us tease this apart. And it could be that there are things that we typically look for in fMRI, for example, which is very expensive and, and very, you know, you can't do it to infants and there's all kinds of limitations to it that you can do with fNIRS and you can do with EEG. And also the same, same argument for combined EEG and fNIRS. So there are markers that we know about in one modality that we can see in others, but we don't know how to yet. And this is another good example of things that we can do with these, these hybrid experiments and progress we can make. And I see a lot of applications in clinical in that regard, because it's a lot easier, if you know exactly what you're looking for in EG, it's a lot easier to slap an electrode on somebody's head and say, hey, this person just had a concussion, even though we don't know how to do that yet. But if if we can if we can tease that apart a little bit more by referencing and co-registering with other modalities, there are a lot of clinical applications. I'm, I'm not I'm not saying anything specific at the moment, but I think the, the potential for this is very, very big. Okay, perfect, thank you. Uh, and actually the next question is also for you, David, it's quite technical. So there are basically a user is trying to stream data using a web-based front front end interface and LSL is the back end. Um, in the LSL documentation, there is no usage with app application. Is it possible to real-time stream data from an LSL port in the web front end? Uh, 
Also, are there any modules or libraries that support this? Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is this is this kind of stuff is is something that we as the LFL LSL developer community have been very resistant to doing. And the, the reason is very simple and that is security. Uh, as soon as you put anything on the web like this, um, you have problems. Uh, and a lot of this information that we're getting from LSL is of course very sensitive and, and personal data uh, that needs to be anonymized. And, and so we're really waiting to add a lot of security. For example, encryption, just simple encryption is something that we need before we can let this sort of thing out into the open. Uh, so at the moment, no, but coming soon, and if you poke around on the internet and various developer forums, you can find some people that have done this, but it's not really part of the official LSL distribution. Okay, but it's kind of, there is the idea, but it's at the very early stages of possible implementation. There's there's no technical reason it cannot be done. Um, uh, there's, yeah, and you can you can you can configure you can hack it from the from the front end, right? Like you can you can you can put a hook into your network and then run the LSL locally and get to it that way. Um, mm -hmm. That's that's not ideal, um, but again, I think we need I think we need stronger security protocols before we can really start mm -hmm. to to let people do this sort of willy nilly. Okay, okay, perfect. Uh, the next question is about the setup. So um, a user is saying that they place optodes on sensory regions and in between EEG gel-based electrodes. Is there any uh, problem due to EEG? So that's exactly the same setup we had today. So we did not use dry electrodes. We use active electrodes that require gel. And uh, the answer is it depends on the gel. So we all, you have to use, so maybe we can show, I don't know what is the name of this gel. Um, here. Uh, so, uh, yeah, thank you. So it's kind of transparent. So uh, of course we we have to use something that uh, allows light to go through, right? Uh, so if you use a gel that is transparent, completely transparent, or almost transparent like this one, this is a blue gel, but uh, light goes through, then there is no problem. Of course, you should not completely soak the optodes in the gel; they are not uh, waterproof. But uh, you know, as uh, if there is some quantity uh, of of the if, if the optodes do come in contact with the gel, that's no problem at all. If you use uh, older type EEG with passive electrodes that require abrasive paste. Uh, that's a no. That's a very uh, hard no. So, because this can over time, first of all, it's opaque. So, you, the the near signal quality may be very much influenced. And second of, of all, second, over time, it may damage the optodes. It uh, the surface may be may be completely uh, scratched, right? So most of the if you are unsure, you please contact us. We are happy to give you guidelines on what gel to use. But uh, generally, it is quite easy to find a suitable gel that will be no problem at all, as we have shown today. Um, okay, and I think there is a last question. Uh, yes, Patrick, sorry. And maybe sometimes the question is about co-locating. So in an older version, we had a ring electrode and the optode right through it because the people wanted to basically measure the same neural activity. But uh, a, this is you sacrifice uh, in the in the setup of the EEG, and you sacrifice in the setup of the NIS, and it has just not shown to be as good in recording. There's no substitute for recording good data, and it was just not as good as spacing them in between. And the other thing that you learn is your F NIRS is we talk about that photo banana that the the, the path where the photons travel from from the from source to detector is kind of this banana shaped thingy and if you place actually your electrode in between this is more or less basically recording from the same location so co-localizing them on the cap is coming with a lot of disadvantage and little advantage this is the reason why we actually went away from it and this also keeps you out of the problem to discuss whether your optodes are sitting in the jail or not. And the jail uh, that you were actually showing the, 
the, the brain product super Whisk is a very nice gel for doing combined recordings because it's, it's very viscous and it stays in place even during some movement and warm temperatures while other gels starting to creep under your under the cap this gel stays in place and it doesn't creep under your upload so you don't have the problem in the first place uh, thanks for that. I actually wanted to, to comment on that because really from the practical experience, uh, uh, the, the so-called collocated channel, as you mentioned, they are first of all not collocated at all if you place the optode at the same place as the electrode. But second, for from a practical uh, perspective, it's extremely difficult because uh, as we did it today, we basically have two independent setups, right? You have your grid of electrodes and you have the grid of optodes and first you make sure you have a good EEG signal and then you make sure you have Good, uh, good near signal. They don't interfere in any way one with the other. If they are collocated, uh, you know, you, for example, moving the optode around to put some gel may displace the optode and may somehow influence the, the near signal. So that, that's that's another consideration that makes it not so practical. And I think we have a last question. I'm not sure I understand it correctly. So basically, they are asking, David, is um, LSL limited to the acquisition of data or does it help with analysis and I think it helps in the you know it makes it easier because everything is automatically synchronized but are there any other advantages uh, when uh, when doing analysis uh, for having used LSL for the acquisition? Uh, the, the main LSL doesn't doesn't provide any any tools for for data analysis apart from things that have to do with time. So uh, when you, as I mentioned, when you record data in LSL, you record also all this time information. And when you load data using one of the loader programs, you change the time information. You actually make it more accurate by doing the synchronization and dejittering procedure. And this makes it possible to say that these points in time are aligned at time. It does not do anything to the actual values associated with the timestamps. So the uh, the actual values represented by each discrete uh, sample uh, remain exactly the same. And it's up to the user to do any kind of uh, uh, transformation such as, you know, using um, wave wavelets or whatever, um, whatever analysis process you're going to do. Uh, I would say that one I don't want to say anything bad about uh, a brain products product like Analyzer, but one thing that I like because I come from a developer's point of view is I want to get to the data at the code level. And LSL does let you do that much more easily than if you record using, in the case of EEG, if you're using the, well, I don't know. It's the, uh, I don't know if there's a, Python reader for the brain vision file format, although it's an open source file format, so you could make one. Um, but no, LSL doesn't 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 give you any any automatic tools. There are, however, a lot of software packages that use LSL that are analysis packages. Um, I mentioned EEG Lab and ME Lab, and those are very powerful open source toolboxes. Um, but there are also online uh, tools such as uh, TimeFlux, which is a Python-based program, uh, and uh, the company Intheon has a has a has a, a package called. I'm forgetting the name of it. Um, I'll remember it five minutes after the webinar is over. Um, but there are, there are also commercial uh, toolboxes that that are are using LSL for real-time analysis. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, perfect. So I will, I will go with the next question. Feel free to interrupt me if you remember the name while I'm, you know, while we are on the next question. <laughs> I'll, I'll look it up. I'll look it up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Think, think about it. <laughs> so the next question is whether the XDF file can be read in the FNIR toolbox or into Homer. So um, uh, Blanca, please correct me if I'm wrong. Homer does not read XDF and Homer also does not support, does not do any EEG analysis. Uh, when it comes to, however, Homer or the near toolbox, uh, you can uh, definitely use the direct export from Aurora. So Aurora exports the data in the .nears file for Homer 2 or in the .snr file for Homer 3. 
and uh, all the triggers are saved in there. So the file is independent of whether it, it's not aware of whether you recorded data using LSL or not. So if you want to use uh, Homer 2 or the near Sobox for analysis, you simply load the data as directly exported uh, by Aurora. No need for any extra steps, no need to, to, to read the XDF file. If you do want to do integrated NIRS and, e, um, and EEG analysis, and the NIRS toolbox does allow that, I don't think XDS is supported, so you do have to convert, and that's exactly what we're going to show next week. So um, please, uh, please attend the webinar. It's on the 18th, yeah, right? It's on the 18th. Uh, where, where, because we are, we are going to try to analyze in the near toolbox with with Tad exactly the XCF that we uh, that we that we exported today. Yeah. And uh, and also because the, the near toolbox based MATLAB based and actually Homer has also some MATLAB uh, import functions. You can use the the XDF um, reader that it's our, the loader that's already um, that we show today at the end of the demo. It's mm -hmm. also possible to do that way, so you can you can have access to the data. Um, but, but for the moment, since Homer does not uh, yeah. analyze yeah, EG, just there, there will be no that. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. But uh, as mentioned, please play field next week, so we will show you how to do that. Pat will show how to do that in, in your toolbox. Exactly. Uh, I think that's pretty much it. We are so much over time. Thank you so much, Thank David, you. for the patience. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you uh, so much for the many questions and for the interest. This was really awesome. As we mentioned at the beginning, uh, the video will be available uh, very soon on our website. And I think most probably the slides as well. We may send you the resource, David, that you were trying to share as well for email. Um, uh, if you remember, there was an, uh, some, some, some tutorial or something that you wanted to share that, that we may follow up with the yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, is there any other uh, uh, neuropipe.io? That's it? Yeah, that's okay. the toolbox I was thinking of, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, okay, I think, uh, I think that's all. Uh, any other questions from the team? Anyone wants, uh, you know, uh, to comment on anything? No. Okay. Okay, perfect. Th thanks. Thanks again, David. This was really fantastic. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Bye, bye. Bye. -bye.